How many days are there in a non-leap year? It's 365, of course. But what if I told you that there was one year in the British Isles, North America, which had only 354 days? That people in that year went to bed on the night of the 2nd of September and woke up on the morning of the 14th, despite only a few hours having passed. The concept of this much lost time is like something out of a sci-fi movie, but this really happened in the year 1752, and today's video from History Calling is going to explain not just why it occurred and the chaos which resulted for some people, but why it wasn't even a unique event. In fact, there have been 18 such instances of time jumps all across the world between 1582 and 1924, and the first day of the year used to be the 25th of March, not the 1st of January. So what on earth was happening, and is it going to happen again? To explain these numerous time jumps, we have to begin in ancient Rome, with none other than Julius Caesar. At that point, the Roman system of managing the date was a mess. I'm not even going to get into it, but suffice to say that Caesar correctly realised that whole-scale reform was needed in order to get humanity back in sync with the seasons and with celestial events like the amount of time it takes the planet to spin once on its axis or orbit the sun. He therefore passed a decree which instituted the Julian calendar, named after him of course. The year 46 BC needed to have 445 days in order to sort out the pickle Rome was in, and was known as the Year of Confusion. Indeed, it still seems to be causing confusion today, as many sources I read said that it was actually 45 BC, which was extra long. The Royal Museum's Greenwich website, though, says that the Year of Confusion was 46 BC, so that's what I'm going with. Once this super long year was done, Caesar declared that most years would now last 365 days, with an extra day every fourth year, and all would begin on the 1st of January. This sounds good, but his understanding of how long a celestial year is, that is, how long it takes us to go once around the sun, was slightly off. He believed it was 365 and a quarter days, thus the need for a leap year every fourth year. But while the calculations he had at his disposal were very close, they weren't quite right. He was out by 11 minutes and change. This doesn't seem like much, but over the course of many centuries, it added up. By the 16th century, the calendar drift meant that the four equinoxes, which had been set as the 21st of March, the 21st of June, the 21st of September and the 21st of December by the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, had all moved back by 10 days to the 11th of each of those months. This in turn was really messing up the date of Easter, which wasn't something Julius Caesar had had to think about, having lived before Jesus Christ, but which had also been set by the council as being on the Sunday after the full moon, which followed the spring equinox, as long as it didn't clash with Jewish Passover. This is an insanely complicated system, which we're not going to discuss any further here. All that matters is that the Catholic Church didn't like Easter being jerked around, even if the system for calculating it was already a bit ungainly. Something had to be done. Before we get to how the problem was solved, though, we need to talk about the start of the year, because that was no longer as straightforward as it had once been either. As I've mentioned, Caesar had established this as the 1st of January, but in the early 6th century AD, an enterprising Roman monk called Dionysius Exiguus calculated, and I think it's best not to examine his maths too closely, that Jesus had been conceived on the 25th of March and born on the 25th of December. Therefore, the 25th of March should be the first day of the year. He took the supposed year of Christ's birth, which he also got wrong, as year 1 AD, not year 0, and so the current BC and AD system that we have today was established. This system is also known as BCE and CE, which stand for Before Common Era and Common Era. 
Dionysius's efforts also help to explain where we get Christmas Day from, though there's a whole other discussion we could have about how it also aligns pretty closely with the winter solstice and older pagan festivals, but that's for another video. Now let's look at how the 10-day calendar drift, which had accumulated by the 16th century, was solved. Just before I explain that though, if you're enjoying this content, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel with the notification bell switched on so that YouTube lets you know when I upload. For more from History Calling, you can also find me on Patreon, where I share perks including early access to videos and mini podcasts. I also have an Amazon storefront, which you might like to check out, where I've listed various products, usually history themed, which you might be interested in. These two sites, plus my Instagram page, are linked in the description box below for you. Thank you to everyone who already supports me by using them, and to those of you who make one-off donations to the channel using the thanks button underneath videos. In 1582, Pope Gregory XIII decided that all the Catholic dominions over which he held sway were going to ditch the Julian calendar and adopt the new Gregorian one, named after him of course. In this new system, the beginning of the year would revert to being the 1st of January. The equinoxes were reset, which allowed the dating of Easter to be better controlled. Leap years would occur in all years divisible by four, except centennial years not divisible by 400. In other words, no leap years in 1700, 1800 and 1900. And most crucially of all, there would be a 10-day time jump between the 5th and 15th of October 1582. If you're wondering why that month was chosen, it was because it had the fewest religious festivals and would therefore offer the least disruption to the church. This was the first of the 18 jumps I mentioned at the start of the video, and occurred in Italy, Spain, Portugal, and a big chunk of Poland. It took some time, no pun intended, for news of his orders to get around Catholic Europe, but before 1582 was done, France, Belgium, and the Catholic areas of the Netherlands had followed suit. They were joined by Austria in 1583, Catholic Switzerland in 1584, and Hungary in 1587. What about Protestant countries, though, such as good old England? Well, they were rather slower off the mark. Queen Elizabeth I actually showed herself quite willing to have England, Wales and Ireland make the change, but her Archbishop of Canterbury and other leading churchmen weren't having it, and the proposals were dead in the water by the mid-1580s. That said, just to make things extra complicated, the 1st of January was already back to being used as the beginning of the year for most purposes, except legal ones. This book was given by a young Elizabeth Tudor to her father, Henry VIII, as a New Year's gift in January 1546, for example. The 25th of March was still considered the beginning of the legal year, however, and this led to all sorts of fun when it came to dating documents. Now, even today, we have some temporal differences around the world. Twice a year, in the UK and Ireland, for instance, and other places too, the clocks change by one hour, springing forward in the spring and falling back in the fall, or autumn as we call it here. Then we have time zones. The planet is divided into dozens of artificial time zones set by humans. Most of these last for one hour, but just to complicate it further, there are places in the world that operate on 30 and even 15 minute increments, so I'm not going to attempt to tell you the actual number of time zones, as I'm not sure there's one answer that would satisfy everyone. The fact that some places use daylight savings and some places don't also makes the whole thing even more headache inducing. The upshot, though, is that people in Australia and New Zealand are way ahead of those of us in the UK, and even further ahead than those in the United States. Thus, we get the amusing experience, once every 12 months, of seeing New Zealand and Australia enter a new year, while the rest of us lag behind in the old one. Between 1582 and 1924, though, depending on where and when you were on the planet, the difference could be as much as 13 days and separate dating systems had to be invented to indicate which calendar you were using and allow other people to translate those dates. This was known as the Old Style System, which referred to the Julian calendar and was shortened to OS, 
and the new style, which referred to the Gregorian and was shortened to NS. The best way to explain how this all worked is to show you some examples. This letter was sent between two correspondents, both living in Ireland, which still use the Julian calendar at this point, and was written between the 1st of January and the 25th of March, so it only needed to take account of the differing dates of New Year. Thus we see that the writer has given the date as March the 16th, 1750-1, meaning it's 1750 in the old-style Julian calendar, which takes the 25th of March as the New Year, but 1751 in the new style Gregorian calendar. We would say that this was written in the year 1751. Now let's look at something a little more complicated. This letter was written in Paris to be sent to England, so the writer and recipient were actually living under different calendars. In this case, the writer has had to take into account the fact that the date he was writing the letter was an entirely different day from the point of view of his recipient. For the writer, the letter was composed on the 29th of January, 1650. From the recipient's point of view, it was written on the 19th of January, because the two calendars were 10 days apart. We see this represented in the way the double date has been given. The letters SONO after the year 1650 are an indication that the writer is using the new style dating. It means stilo novo, which translates to new style. Another way of explaining this would have been to write 1649 50. This actually isn't the most complicated letter dating you could get, though. Imagine this letter had been written three days later. In that case, the author would have needed to clarify that he and the recipient we're now living in different months, and so the date would have needed to look something like this. 1st of February slash 22nd of January 1649 slash 50. As you can see, having multiple calendars in use around the world created all sorts of hoops for our ancestors to jump through. Even more entertaining from our point of view is that it could also lead to a form of time travel for those who physically crossed the calendar lines. One famous example comes from the Glorious Revolution of 1688, when Prince William of Orange, nephew and son-in-law of James II of England, crossed from Holland into England in order to effectively depose James. William set sail from Helvoetsluis, where the Gregorian calendar ruled, on the 11th of November. He then travelled for four days, but landed in Brixham on the 5th of November, where the Julian calendar was in force, and six days before he left. Now, if that doesn't make her head spin, I don't know what will. This messy situation continued in Great Britain and Ireland until 1752, with the notable exception being that Scotland had adopted the 1st of January as the start of the legal year back in 1600, before its king, James VI, had inherited Elizabeth I's crown, and long before the 1707 legal union of England slash Wales and Scotland. By the mid-18th century, though, the time was ripe for change. The difference between the Gregorian and Julian calendars had now risen to 11 days, thanks to the lack of a leap year in 1700, and Philip Dormer Stanhope, 4th Earl of Chesterfield, sought to rectify this mess once and for all. On the 25th of February, 1750-51, that's in the old-style Julian calendar, he introduced a bill in the House of Lords to make the calendar switch the next year. It passed and was given the royal signature on the 22nd of May. The 1st of January, 1752, was taken as the start of the legal year, and eight months later, the big switchover arrived. Throughout all British dominions, which still included its American colonies at this point, Wednesday the 2nd of September was followed by Thursday the 14th. As with the 1582 change, the timing was deliberate. For as historian Robert Poole, writing in the journal Past and Present in 1995, has explained, this period was, quote, chosen to avoid conflict with any major festivals and with the law term. Over the ensuing centuries, most of the rest of the world, who weren't already on the Gregorian calendar, followed suit. 
so that today there is no country left on the Julian calendar, though some religious organisations continue to use it, or indeed another completely separate calendar. There are specific Jewish and Islamic calendars, for instance, to give just two examples. Notably, China and Russia, which are two of the largest countries on Earth and therefore home to a huge chunk of its population, only changed over to the Gregorian system in 1912 and 1918 respectively. China still uses its own traditional calendar as well though, which governs many of its holidays. And this is why you can still see celebrations for Chinese New Year and hear about which animal is associated with a particular year. The Eastern Orthodox Church in Romania, plus Yugoslavia as it was called at the time, and Greece switched to the Gregorian system in 1924, by which point the difference between it and the Julian calendar was up to 13 days. Not everyone was happy about changing calendars, of course, not least because it caused some confusion about when birthdays and anniversaries ought to be celebrated. And strictly speaking, everyone alive on the 2nd of September 1752 ought to have pushed their birthday celebrations forward by 11 days for the rest of their lives. So a baby born on the 2nd of September that year really ought to have celebrated their first birthday on the 13th of September 1753, in order for 365 days to have passed since its birth. Of course, I'm sure that many didn't bother altering their dates and instead continued to mark their birthdays on the old day, even though they were still a week and a half shy of what we'll call their natural date of birth. Official anniversaries and holidays were mostly kept to their original dates, with no adjustments made. Thus, Christmas still occurred on the 25th of December. It's just that the 25th of December arrived 11 days earlier than it would otherwise have done. This also means that many of the anniversaries we still mark of events which occurred in Britain and America before the switch are incorrect. For instance, if you look up what date Elizabeth I died on, you'll find that it's given as the 24th of March 1603, or as the English would have written it at the time, the 24th of March 1602-3 because they didn't count the new year as starting until the next day. Yes, Elizabeth I actually died on New Year's Eve. If you wanted to mark the anniversary of her death, though, you wouldn't do so on that date. Instead, you'd move it forwards to the 4th of April. Many anniversaries have not been adjusted, though, and so we mark famous events on the wrong day, though how out of sync they are with the original date depends on when and where the original event occurred and when that country made the switch to the Gregorian system. There are exceptions, of course one of which takes us back to the aftermath of the Glorious Revolution, for it relates to the famous Battle of the Boyne, which was fought on this spot in Ireland between the forces of James II and William III. The battle occurred on the 1st of July 1690 in the Julian calendar, but it is commemorated by some people in Northern Ireland in particular on the 12th of July, thus compensating for the calendar change. The British legislation did try to prevent some of the more serious potential problems surrounding the change. Rents, for example, were to be charged according to the actual number of days a property had been rented. Landlords could not charge for the 11 days which had been jumped. Likewise, workers could not demand salaries for those missing days either. Annual fairs presented a trickier problem particularly if they were tied to the seasons, like harvest fairs where a change of 11 days might mean that some produce wasn't ripe yet. Unlike events such as Christmas, they were allowed to change their dates to keep them in line with the seasons, though not all did so and there was an adjustment period of a few years during which fair dates had to be very well advertised to make sure everyone knew what was happening. The calendar change has also been the cause of a popular pseudo-history tale. This is the story that people actually rioted in parts of England, calling out to be given their 11 days back. This story is largely based on this satirical image by William Hogarth, which was released in February 1755, two and a half years after the switch. In it, we see a placard, just one of many pieces of text shown in the picture, reading, Give us our 11 days. This image is called an election entertainment though, and not only is it tied to an election rather than the calendar issue, 
it doesn't even show a riot. Nevertheless, over time, the story of the calendar riots has grown to such an extent that you can find websites declaring that these disturbances really happened, and that some people even died during them. Robert Poole has ascertained, however, that, quote, it can be asserted with confidence that the calendar riots are a myth. To finish, let's consider whether time jumps of the type I've discussed in this video will happen again in the future. I have to tell you, it's possible. We are getting 25.92 seconds ahead of the sun every year, and so if we do nothing, then in a couple of thousand years' time, we'll need to cancel a leap year in order to correct for that. Everyone go put it in your diaries. I hope you've enjoyed our little jaunt around the timeline today, and I especially hope that I've calculated all the changing dates correctly. If I've made a mistake somewhere, please do forgive me. Trying to keep track of everything was a nightmare. Question of the day. Should we alter the anniversary dates we celebrate famous events on so that they align with their Gregorian calendar now in use, or just keep marking them on the quote-unquote wrong day? Let me know what you think in the comments below, and until next time, keep learning.